Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the International Alliance for Phytobiomes Research webinar series. And very pleased to have with us today Chris Jones from North Carolina State University, the Center for Geospatial Analytics. And, but before we get into uh, Chris's presentation, I'm going to give you a, a short overview of the Phytobiomes Alliance. So we are an international uh, nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists. I want to thank our sponsors who make it possible for us to have the webinar series and to support our activities and efforts to coordinate research in the phytobiomes space. A lot of people uh, think that phytobiomes is just a plant microbiome, but in fact, the term itself implies a complex system of plant-based agriculture. It is the concept of a particular biome with a plant, and from our perspective, an agriculturally related plant might be a, a crop, a grassland species, or a, a tree. Uh, in a particular space and all of the geophysical and, and biological uh, components that interact with it. It is also heavily influenced by management practices uh, that influence not only the plant, but all of the species and components within the biome. So our vision is that by 2050, all farmers, and I use that term very broadly, have the ability to use predictive and prescriptive analytics based on these geophysical and biological conditions for determining what's the best combination of crops, management practices, and inputs for a specific field in a given year. We have a multidisciplinary conference coming up in December, I mean in September in Denver, and Strong, and we'll be calling for abstracts before too long. And we really encourage uh, everyone who is working in this in a multidisciplinary space in agriculture to consider submitting an abstract because we do want to bring a wide range of disciplines together. And we have already received funding from the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. I want to thank them for their support for that conference. So we also, I just want to mention that we have a workshop coming up next week on the future of microbial biotechnology from research all the way to regulation. It's a free workshop uh, and so you can register that at the link here on the uh, slide and you can also find the information on our website. Just to let you know a little bit about the dashboard that you've got, there's a, a button that has the Q&A uh, panels. Please submit your questions in the Q&A panel, not in the chat. You can monitor the chat panel and you can see messages from the organizers. Uh, often if someone mentions a, a, a website, it'll, you'll find the link directly into the chat. You already can download the handouts from our presentations in the handout panel. The webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the Phytobiomes Alliance YouTube channel. And you can subscribe to the channel to never miss one of our presentations. So without further ado, I'd like to again welcome Chris Jones, who will talk to us today about managing pest outbreaks through participatory iterative ecological forecasting. Chris, thank you very much for being with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. There we go. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to the talk, and thanks for the introduction, Kelly. Today, I'll be discussing some of our work using iterative forecasting to improve accuracy for pest and pathogen management. I will also talk about some new applications that we are working on, and I'd like to thank our amazing team of people that have helped make this work possible. Oh, 
According to the Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, in order to feed the world's population by, by 2050, global food production needs to increase by 60% from today's levels. Most of the research funds toward this topic go towards increasing yields. That is one of many ways in which we can increase production. However, yield loss due to pests and diseases account for up to 30% in, produ in production of some of our top food crops globally. And this can be significantly higher in some years than others. So my research focuses on how do we help reduce these losses, specifically when it comes to pest and pathogen damages. So invasive pests and pathogens are increasing globally. And the data shown here is from Sieben Zidal, 2017 in Nature Communications with each box representing 500 new introduced species during the 20 year period. And the US has estimated that losses from these pests and pathogens are greater than $1 billion annually. Oftentimes, these impact, the impacts of these pests aren't well known as they don't have outsized impacts in their native range and little is known about their biology. So modeling these species can be challenging. So many of the environmental challenges like emerging pathogens, pests and pathogens facing our society today require immediate action to offset substantial costs. In response to this need, a new paradigm has emerged within ecology called ecological forecasting, which uses near term, less than decadal, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, and it really depends on what the need is for the decision support systems, and we're, these are forecasts to provide rapid decision support needed to tackle these pressing global issues. This figure illustrates the temporal and spatial scales of ecological processes characteristics, characteristic of a forested ecosystem. But this can be applied to any ecosystem from agricultural to estuaries. See in blue, many of the interventions are at less than decadal scales. And we believe and our results suggest that using iterative ecological forecasting can help us improve our understanding and ability to model pests and pathogens more quickly and transparently. So what is iterative forecasting and why would it be helpful here? So iterative forecasting is the act of continually challenging models with data and testing new hypotheses. And I'll go over some examples of where we're testing some new hypotheses with our models and these are from like field operation uh, observations and other uh, scientific studies. So iterative forecasting has been used in weather forecasting for decades and has been shown to be highly effective at improving weather forecasts with today's seven day forecast being as accurate as the one day forecast from 40 years ago. We believe we can use the same ideas, but applied to ecology to continually update our models as new discoveries are made and continually improve model performance as new data becomes available. In order to accomplish this goal of improving invasive pest and pathogen management, we have designed our forecasting platform around four iterative loops that all work together to improve model performance and applicability for decision makers and other stakeholders. I'll talk about each of these individually and then tie them all together through the and tie them all together through the lens of a single case study, spotted lanternfly that we're working on here in the US. Before I dive in these iterative loops, I wanna first discuss the POPs model and database that are at the heart of our platform. So our open source modeling platform is modular, meaning that parts of the model can be easily turned on or off based on the pest and pathogen of interest, spatially explicit, meaning that what happens in one location affects other locations and dynamic, meaning that changes happen over time and continually build upon themselves in the model, just like they do in real life. So this allows the model to be flexible enough to handle a wide variety of pests and pathogens and allows some researcher, allows other researchers to submit new ideas and contribute code to the platform via GitHub. And here's a, some examples of systems we're working on, specifically sudden oak death. We're working on with the Oregon Department of Forestry 
to help them manage the spread of the disease so it doesn't reach the port of Coos Bay and also helping them to bring to increase the amount of budget that's allocated by the state. And we did this through a workshop that I'll talk about in detail later. We've been working on spotted lanternfly with the USDA APHIS and porcine epidemic diarrhea virus with producers in US states. And our collaborator on this project from the vet school is Dr. Gustavo Machado and his postdoc Jason Galvis led the paper on that. We've been working on late blight with Dr. Gene Restaño and Keyshawn Wei from NC State and their labs, and wheat stripe rust with Dr. Chris Munt from Oregon State University, doing comparing forecasts to field experiments specifically for inoculated wheat stripe rust to see what the best management strategies are. And then we've started two new. Um, disease system, pest and disease systems, citrus greening and glassy wing sharpshooter, which is the vector for Pierce's disease. Now, both of these require some updates to the model to make it so we can support vector pathogen dynamics, which is something we hadn't included yet with any of our other case studies. So we're in the process of adding that to the modeling platform. And our database of pests and pathogens is the key to building is, the, is key to building better models early in the invasion process. Our database stores all relevant information for quickly running the model based on an existing pest and all data that we have collected on that pest. In the future, we can use the parameters and biological tolerances from the database as a Bayesian prior for modeling a newly introduced species where we have little to no information, but know either the family, movement type, or feeding habits of the pest or pathogen. So thinking about phytotheras like late blight and sudden oak death, we could compare them to a new emerging phytothera that we don't have much information on and use those as our beginning uh, parameters for modeling that species. Now I'm gonna be focusing on spotted lanternfly forecasts for the rest of this talk. One of the new areas we are working on is adding as many pests and pathogens as possible into the calibration and validation aspects of the platform to further build out the parameter database that we plan to use as that Brazian prior I was talking about. And now I'm going to show a quick video illustrating how the simulation works through space and time. We use environmental drivers and current detections coupled with statistically derived parameters to forecast spread into the future across space and time. These red circles show the number of spotted lanternfly or another pest dispersing from a cell. The model then determines where they disperse to via multiple dispersal kernels, and they can either establish or not, depending on the environmental conditions where they arrive. So again, the red circles indicate the number of a pest dispersing from a cell. The model then determines where they disperse to, and they can disperse to and increase the propagule pressure or the amount of pest in that given in that cell as well as you saw in the previous iteration. And this happens through space and time, and that is how we get landscape scale simulations at um, regional to country levels. So our first iterative loop is the calibration loop. And this is where as new data becomes available, we challenge the model with that data and our prior parameters to improve our model by updating our posterior parameter distributions. And again, I'm gonna be discussing this in the context of spotted lanternfly. So first let's talk a little bit, of, I'll introduce what spotted lanternfly is. So spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper from Asia that was first discovered in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and has rapidly spread since and is now found in 11 states in the US. There are over 90 counties quarantined across those 11 states, and some of the crops at risk are grapes, apples, almonds, and other uh, orchard type fruit. And the big concern for spotted lanternfly has been grapes in terms of damage that's been shown to be done. 
Here's the basic equation governing our spotted lanternfly model. We calibrate the parameters beta, alpha 1, alpha 2, and gamma whenever new data arrives. We do this using approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC. ABC works by setting a starting threshold value for accuracy metrics and assigning a number of generations and particles per generation. Each particle represents a simulation with a parameter set with accuracy metrics better than that set threshold. Once the par enough particles are kept to match the number we selected, the next generation begins. There are two key differences be between our ABC implementation and the first generation and subsequent generations. The first is that the threshold values change to the mean of the particles kept from the previous generation and the second is that the parameter sets are drawn from a multivariate normal distribution using the means and covariance matrix from, of the parameters from the previous generation. Thus, for each generation, the simulation improves in accuracy while drawing parameters from a more reasonable distribution to cut down on computational time. So, not, so the methods we, metrics we use for this are quantity, disagreement, allocation disagreement, and configuration disagreement. I'll explain what each of these are in turn. So quantity disagreement is the number of locations simulated as infected versus the number of locations actually observed infected. In both of these example simulations, you can see that the quantity disagreement is zero. Allocation disagreement is whether or not the simulated infections are in the same location as the observed. In both of these example simulations, you can see that the allocation disagreement is seven. However, they have different configurations. So despite that these two simulations have identical quantity and allocation disagreements, we as landscape ecologists most intuitive, likely intuitively say simulation A is better than B visually. This is where the configuration disagreement comes into play. So configuration disagreement determines how well the pattern of the simulation matches the pattern of the observed data using the number of patches, mean nearest neighbor distance between patches, and mean perimeter area ratio of patches. The rest of the talk, I'll focus specifically on the quantity and configuration disagreement metrics, as well as some new metrics that we're exploring as well. So this graph, graph represents our posterior distribution for, for each year after challenging and updating the model with that year's data. And all of our data in this case comes from the State Department of Agriculture's, Pennsylvania, New York, et cetera, where spotted lanternfly is found, and the US, USDA, US Department of Agriculture's Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS. Here are those same parameter distributions for the posterior distribution of our beta parameter for the years 2016 through 2019. And the graph in the bottom left shows the percent quantity disagreement for each of those calibration years over the duration of the study. And the graph on the right shows the configuration disagreement for each of the calibration years over the duration of the data. As you can see, that iteratively updating our parameters improves forecast accuracy over time. And this work has been published recently in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. And we'll be using these calibrated parameters for the rest of the talk to go over some new features that we are including in the model. So the second aspect of our platform is the scenario modeling loop. And this is where we work with stakeholders that are managing the pest or pathogen to run realistic treatment interventions to control the spread of the species. This information is used for making more informed decisions about when, where, and what treatments to apply. Our research is highly focused on building spatial decision support systems around our forecast, and we have two of those. And here I'm showing a video of the web-based dashboard that you can find at popsmodel.org. And we have developed, that we have developed to allow users to interact with the model and data. We aggregate detections, the spatial grain of one kilometer, in the ca case for filled and simulated data, the user can select from a number of additional data layers for display that can provide context for management, 
such as host, railroad, etc. The user can also select which ones stay as well as which data they can see. And there are two types of management. The first is host removal, where you can select that you want to do host removal for the pest's primary host or pesticide application. And pesticide in this case includes insecticides, fungicides, etc. We just needed an all-encompassing term for that. So, and you can select from different pesticides for the given um, case, the given pest that you're interested in. And we pull in the FXC of those from the literature when it's available. Otherwise, we ask that the user supplies that if they know it for their particular case. So for spotted lanternfly, it's been observed that it primarily spreads along railway corridors for long distance dispersal. So here we're showing that the different mechanisms that you can use for drawing management along those rail corridors, including these like pre-described uh, circles, because if for one of our, um, for Sun Oak Death, they specifically do a buffer around their, um, around the host that they want to remove. So they remove all the hosts within a buffer of 250 meters from where they found Sun and Oak Death. So we implemented that specifically for managers there. And the model takes about a minute to run and then provides the results for three to four, five years, depending on how long the manager wanted to simulate. And then you can look at the different outputs from the model. and see how that, see how your treatment's affected. And then you can draw management again. And this is a feature that was highly requested by our, a couple of our uh, stakeholder, stakeholders when we were doing workshops with them, was the ability to run multiple years of management through the, the dashboard and our other platform, which I'll show next. And the idea is that you can do what's known as computational steering, where basically you can pause the simulation, return to the previous state, and compare these different, the effect of running multiple different management outcomes. So you can compare, if you had a three-year plan, how much different it would be if you stopped spending at a certain point in time. In addition to our web-based dashboard, we have a tangible user interface that uses a projector and 3D scanning coupled to GRASS-GIS for the computation of our model. And I'll show a quick video of that. So here's tangible landscape in action, and you use these felt pieces to place management interventions. These felt pieces are scanned and digitized by that um, 3D scanner and we're projecting down the NAEP data as well as the current infection locations. And then you push the button to run the model. The model will run and you can see it, the spread happening over time. And that's a probability surface with red indicating higher probability and yellow indicating lower probability. And that has that computational steering piece as well. The third loop is the field observation and scientific feedback loop. This is where the new data on species locations is collected and new field studies are performed to help improve our understanding of the pest or pathogens biology and how we apply this as updates to our model to test new hypotheses. I'll be going into details about some of the new observations that have been done for spotted lanternfly and exactly how they improve the model. So, so here we're looking at the original temperature curve for spotted lanternfly. And when we first started modeling spotted lanternfly, the only data on the effect of temperature on spotted lanternfly reproduction and survival 
were from a small coral live study out of Korea. And that's the data we had to use for our model, uh, like, because like I said, occasionally you just don't have a lot of data when a newly invasive species is found that just hasn't been published on because it wasn't very damaging in its native country. So, but in October of 2020, Kretman et al. published SF spotted lanternfly survival based on temperature tolerances. And we used their study to update the temperature driver data for survival and reproduction in our model. This allows us to have a comparison of how integrating that new information with our best set of parameters affects our forecast accuracy as measured by accuracy, precision, recall, sensitivity, specificity, and odds ratio in this case. And so here I'm showing the confusion matrix and how we calculate along with the equations for calculating accuracy, precision, recall, sensitivity, specificity, and odds ratio, and showing the old temperature values in red and the Kretman temperature changes here in blue. As you can see, we got about a seven to seven and a half percent improvement in model accuracy, a slight improvement in precision, a slight decrease in recall, and a almost 19% increase in specificity and a five point increase in the odds ratio. And the other good thing about this is that for accuracy and specificity specifically, the variability in, our accu in those accuracy metrics decreased as well. So that's shown here in the parentheses. So, including this new information from these new scientific studies has greatly increased our model performance over time. And so now I wanna talk about adding a new model feature based on observation data. During field surveys, survey teams have observed that when spotted lanternfly densities in an area become large, spotted lanternflies tend to disperse longer distances in large numbers. In order to model this, we added a feature to the model that simulated density dependent dispersal. So as spotted lantern flies, so spotted lantern flies left, if their numbers were above 70% of the carrying capacity, we simulated that around 50% of the spotted lantern fly in that cell would disperse three times our calibrated alpha one or natural distance dispersal parameter. One thing to note with these numbers is that they aren't based on measured in the field or calibrated for the best fit to the data. That's the next step for this work. They're instead based on conversations we had with survey teams to, term, to determine what seemed to be appropriate based on their observations. Overall, this change had little impact on model outcomes. So here we have the model on the left, the values without the large population movements and the values with large population movements. So, and there's really not much change in terms of our overall parameter value. The improvement in the model, it's slightly increased across the board and the variability slightly decreased as well. So this is probably a good addition, but it's not statistically significant. But the more realistic we can make it for the managers, the more likely they are to build trust in the model and the more likely they are to use it for management in the future. So even though this didn't lead to a much better model, it's still worth adding in terms of showing that we are listening to our stakeholders, we're incorporating what they're seeing in the field, and we're testing these hypotheses to see if it actually makes a difference on a large scale, if modeling this is worth it or not, or if it just adds computational complexity to, complexity to the model that may not be necessary. So we're gonna do some more testing with this after we've calibrated some param the parameters for this particular, specifically the uh, carrying capacity at which spotted lantern fly leaves and how what percentage of them leave. Those two parameters will be 
as well as how far it disperses. Although there's been a new paper released recently on dispersal where they actually followed a group of spotted lanternfly and recorded how far they dispersed. So we'll probably use that paper as our basis for that multiplier effect for our natural dispersal um, parameter. And the so in addition to um, that work, we've been working with Dr. Jean Restanio in Keyshawn Wan's lab here at North Carolina State to look at creating smart smartphone sensors and technology to detect Phytophthora infestans, TSWV, and Phytophthora morum and Cronovia as well. So the first two are on tomato, and then the other two are kind of forest diseases that affect oak trees and other species. But what we'll, but the idea is that you can use these field-based surveys to determine whether or not what you're seeing in the field is one of these diseases. It sends it to a database via a smartphone application, and all of this can be run in the field in like an hour. We're still in kind of the beta phase of testing this technology in the Phytotron, but we're hoping to roll it out this summer to field experiments in Western North Carolina for the tomato parts of this process and then rhododendron experiments and uh, sampling in greenhouses as well. And the idea there is that we just are able to collect data faster, better, and map it back out for our stakeholders. And then that can be used in the modeling as well. So in the fourth loop in the is the participatory feedback loop. And this is where we're really, really working closely with our stakeholders to make sure that they understand the system and that it matches their understanding of the biology in the field and what they're actually seeing. And that we understand their needs and what they want this tool to do. So this can involve updating the model to match the outputs that are meaningful to them updating the interface to display the information in a way that helps them make more informed decisions. And that's where we, they asked for some of those additional data layers that I showed in that video and updating the data and model to better match our combined understanding of the system. And that's um, where we were discussing that uh, change from field operations for spotted lantern fly based on density dependent dispersal. So we've had two field, we've had two workshops with the Oregon Department of Forestry and stakeholders that are managing spot sun and oak death in Oregon. One in 2017 and another in 2019. And both these focused on getting better management outcomes for Oregon Department of Forestry in terms of managing sod, but also getting feedback on what they would like to see as improvements in the model. So in the 2017 workshop, one thing that was asked for, or multiple things were asked for, one was improving our host map, which we did, and I'll talk a bit more about projects we have to improve mapping of hosts at large scales. And the other was, and in two, the other one was doing the computational steering where you saw that we could do management across multiple years in the simulation and the interface. So, and then the one in 2019, we actually held with all the stakeholders from the Oregon Department of Forestry, um, the other land managers from Bureau of, Bureau of Land Management onward, and two Oregon state senators that were there to determine what budget level would be most appropriate. So the workshop actually led to a 25% increase in the budget for managing sudden oak death, which was really cool to actually see these senators engaged with the models. They were testing different scenarios and they were testing different budgets to see 
what seemed to actually make the biggest difference based on the best available data that they had and the best models that we had at the time. So that was a really fun outcome was actually doing that. And we, had, the other piece we did was we compared the uh, preference of users for the web dashboard versus the online or versus that tangible user interface. And that works out in uh, Gato CDAO 2001, which I should have actually linked to that publication here. But if you want it, you can ask, you can send me an email after this and I can forward that on to you. And that particular finding was that they thought the online dashboard, when we were doing it kind of as an in-person thing, better facilitated conversations while the tangible landscape allowed them to more quickly test different scenarios. So after that, we've combined the two together so that you can kind of do both. And you can. we've also allowed for online web collaborations now. So multiple people in multiple areas can draw management together while discussing on Zoom. And we did this via WebSockets, which is the basic uh, technology that enables like a chat function for most things. But in this case, we're using it to pass geospatial management data back and forth between different users in different locations. So, and then in June of 2019, we held a Spotted Lanternfly workshop at APHIS headquarters with 30 APHIS personnel from science and technology, field operations, and regulatory working groups. And this was to discuss the Spotted Lanternfly model, what management scenarios they were currently doing, and just kind of show them the progress on the modeling platform. And, and overall, the feedback was really positive. They really liked the tool, and they asked for a couple of additional uh, features to be added. And we've been adding those as we've gone. Sadly, we haven't been able to do in-person workshops where we've been able to do these surveys since COVID started. So we really haven't had another workshop since these last two in, in, at the end of 2019 and summer of 2019. But we've been doing online workshops with folks. We just haven't been able to do like the detailed surveys and feedback sessions as well. So we're trying to work through that piece of it virtually. So, and in conclusion, those are the kind of iterative loops that so we have these four loops that feed onto each other and kind of help improve the overall modeling process, specifically in the form of outcomes for managers and what they care about. So and all of our work to date has mostly focused on large uh, agency decision making, but we're looking to apply it to smaller scale decision spaces which is where some of that work with uh, Dr. Restenio on Late Blight and Dr. Chris Munt on Wheat Stripe Rust is really coming into play, where we're actually trying to simulate field scale applications and treatments and seeing how we can pass information quickly and easily over to farmer stakeholders instead of large decision makers. And here is a diagram showing the entire technology stack, for a better word, that we use from the background model being written in C++ through the R version, the GRASS version. And the R version runs the online dashboard and the GRASS GIS version runs the tangible landscape interface and all of the kind of open source tools and technologies that make it possible for us to actually run this. 
So one thing that we're working on now with um, USDA ARS is hopefully being able to host this on their environment so that it's available for other researchers outside of stakeholders that we're specifically working with because right now we're paying for all the computation so anyone that logged on and was running the model we pay for all like the cloud computing costs and stuff so we're trying to figure out a good system to allow access to the dashboard interface for other researchers to use with stakeholders as well so some of the future directions that we have and applications for the model are we were planning on using the platform to determine the impacts of biocontrol for invasive plants so you can think about this as managing weeds specifically you could think about like kudzu if there was a um, a biocontrol for that but we currently have an application for managing alligator weed in north carolina by releasing through the release of two biocontrol agents and work with a greater variety of stakeholder partners. So these could be growers associations, these could be individual farmers, these could be crop consultants, et cetera, and other potentially other government agencies. So, and one thing I have on here that we actually just added in like the last month that I should have actually talked a bit about and discussed is that we added a network model to actually represent spotted lanternfly spreading over the rails and that increased model performance as well. And we're working on algorithms to optimize across survey and treatments to maximize new knowledge versus reduction in pest populations. And this could also be used for like after these workshops we could look at the strategies that they incorporated and prepare optimal locations based on model outcomes for provide where they can do management in the field. And support for additional model types and new model functionality. So we're working with Dr. Gustavo Machado to add in some of their models for uh, some swine diseases. So PEDV, which we've already worked on, PERS, which is porcine epidemic respiratory I'm gonna butcher this, I think virus, but it's virus syndrome actually, and uh, Asian swine fever. And then we're working with some folks out of Temple, uh, Matt Helmus specifically and his group to add in their spotted lanternfly model so we can do some ensembling model via the interface as well. And then we're working on some AI host mapping with Google Street View, and this is, and that couples with Planet Lab data from Planet Labs, so their three meter product. And this is specifically to map uh, backyard um, kind of fruit and nut crops. So grapes, um, almonds, oranges, apples, et cetera. And that's a USDA NEFA funded project that started this January. And with that, I would like to thank you everyone for coming to the talk and I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Chris. A very interesting uh, platform that you've put together. And just to remind everyone, you can put questions on the Q&A panel, so don't hesitate to do that. So I'm really curious, I'm gonna go back to something you said towards the end about your effort, both in um, wheat rust, and I've forgotten now which the other one was, uh, where you were working on some of the smaller scale uh, applicabilities, because you know obviously you probably saw at the beginning of our presentation, that's really a vision for the Phytomyomes Alliance is to get to that small scale and provide the long-term modeling capabilities for growers. So what do you anticipate that that will take to actually be able to get there? Part of it is data available at that kind of much smaller resolution. Mm -hmm. So with 
Chris Munt's work with wheat stripe rust, we have experimental fields that he's going out, he's inoculating. So we know exactly what they're planning with and we're testing different uh, amounts of resistant versus not resistant wheat and then testing different management practices. So whether or not you like do a call, what size that call is, the timing of that call, how fast you can basic, basically, what's the effect of how fast you discover that's in your field. So data is the main limitation here. The platform could support it as is. It's just data at that scale, which is kind of where that planet data comes into play too, because the three meter resolution gets us down to a much finer resolution where we can actually start looking at field level stuff. Whereas right. previously the best we had was like Sentinel or Landsat, which is 10 meter or 30 meter. Right, right. So, you know, one of the challenges with with getting access to that, you know, fine resolution data mm -hmm. is, of course, confidentiality, growers not wanting information to be provided broad, more broadly, or people to have, they want to de determine who has access to their data. Are you building in any mechanisms to be able to accommodate that where a grower could actually start you know, maybe you have a model where a grower would actually start putting information in and yet would be protected, like you don't have the GPS or the global positioning um, coordinates, for example. I mean, would that, is that a possibility and are you looking at that? Yeah, so part of that is determining what level we need to scale the data to. So in the US, we were thinking like county level might be applicable in terms of scaling up their GPS to just, we have X number in a county, but then yeah. they could use it on their individual farm plots, et cetera. So they could be modeling at that scale, but we could also provide them alerts. Hey, there's others in your county or et cetera. So like we had enough people signed up, we could start providing alerts that this has been discovered in your area, et cetera. Right, and that doesn't really get at the microclimate issue, of course, and some counties are, you know, are very very large no. uh, and you know and of course just looking at it from the u.s perspective but you know and i'm not sure there is a a perfect scenario there but it, no. it's interesting to kind of think about that um one of the questions that has come in is how does the model deal with variation in host resistance so you can basic i didn't really get into this because well we had 40 minutes <laughs> yeah so if you had different hosts you could say basically give them a range of resistance so or susceptible in this case we call it competency and susceptibility are the terms we use because it tries to encompass both terminology from pests and pathogens which is really difficult sometimes <laughs> Um, yeah. But the idea is that a more competent host produces more inoculum, while a more susceptible host gets infected more easily. Yeah. So you can kind of provide ranges for those values, and you can do that across multiple different host species. So you can actually model the different host species as well. All right. So the next question, and we kind of touched on that just a moment ago, is how do you si decide on the square size of the grid or the size of the grid? That's a fantastic question, and it's a combination of data availability, the needs of the stakeholder. So if the stakeholder needs to model at the resolution of the entire, or an extent of the entire US for something, we need to choose a larger grid size just for computational feasibility. Right. So, so yeah, for example, okay. if you're computation, data availability, and what levels the stakeholders are actually doing management at. So that's another key piece is if they're managing 250 meter polygons, like, or that's their man, like buffers around something, then 250 meters seems like a really good size in terms of the management strategy for us to model at or smaller. So basically we try to kind of use what that information from them to help guide some of those decisions. Sometimes it's not feasible just because the data availability is not there. Right. right. But, so 
would an observation application actually help to give you more feedback that you need to verify your models with data from the farmers? Yes, that would be fantastic. And that's part of that work with uh, the app, with specifically for diseases where it's really hard to identify it's a specific disease, right? On the field, so you need to do like PCR or something. So these like field based assays. Yeah, I've seen, yeah, I've seen some of the, there's some new technology where you're using drones, in fact, to go and take pictures to determine, you know, the leaf cover, et cetera, to try to determine whether there's disease presence or not. So, yeah. so the other thing you mentioned, you talked a little bit about you're beginning to bring in network analysis. Does that, would that include like neural networks and looking at things like deep learning and being able to really broaden and deepen the models? Yeah, so we're doing this in a couple of different ways. So the network model specifically is like a geographic network model that we we're talking about for traveling along like rails or via planes, et cetera. So for spread, but for that um, host mapping aspect, we are bringing in like convolutional neural networks for doing the modeling with the Google Street View to the planet data to yeah. first identify what we're looking at in the Google Street View imagery, and then to translate that over to the planet data, pull out the spectral signature, and then map that at a broader scale where we don't actually have the Google Street View or other data sets. So that's really looking using it for images, correct? You're using it, which means, of course, where the yeah. deep learning has really pioneered the, our ability yeah. to understand images. Um, I'm interested, though, in how we would actually build in the let's say the microbiome data or soil data at that at a more granular level um, and one of the things i've wondered about is can we use things like convolutional neural networks that would actually enable us to predict what's happening in a particular field from a microbial standpoint mm -hmm. and what may be happening as a result of disease presence or disease pressures that may be coming in from invasive species of some kind. So, Yeah, and that's something we would like to explore. We have a grad student from computer science who's working in our geospatial program now, and he wants to explore some of that. So the goal is to take our existing model and apply some convolutional neural networks on top that would account for the correlations in weather. Like, so if we're saying it's gonna spread from here to here, weather then affects that spread distance as well as just drawing from a parameter distribution. And so that's where he's targeting that, but I could see that applying to soils and microbiomes, et cetera as well yeah. but that's kind of the first piece that we chose to target was that specifically well we certainly don't have the diagnostic tools refined enough and no. cheap enough to actually <laughs> deploy them at scale no but you know i envision that that will be the case whether that's some kind of sensor data mm -hmm. or some kind of uh, you know, sequencing, in, in situ sequencing or, or things like that, that could then bring that in. Um, one of the other aspects that, let's see. Oh no, I've already asked that question. Um, sorry. Okay, yeah, no, there is another question that has come in. Um, do you think the model could be used as a tool to expedite PRA, I assume that's pest risk assessment, process that NPPOS in different countries conduct? I'm not sure what, um, what that acronym stands for. Yeah, I asked for it to be spelled out so that I don't, but uh, let's see. Marina Dean is still with us. Yeah, kind of but in any case, can it be used for to expedite pest risk assessment? Yeah, and that's one of the things we're actually working on. So our APHIS counterparts at uh, that are the researchers 
are using the model. And right now they're doing box tree moth and they're using, they're calibrating the model based on data from England and applying it to the new outbreak that occurred in Quebec and looking at how that leads to spread into the US. Yeah. And then doing kind of a risk assessment threat based on that. And so in some ways, yes, and that's part of the goal of like calibrating as many pests as possible so we can say, okay, if this got over here, we can grab this, et cetera. And we have some undergrads that are going through and looking for additional data sets in other countries, et cetera. Yeah, so this NPPOs means the National Plant Protection Organization. Isabel no. looked at for us, so right. very much, or Lorena Ayla. So it's, uh, of course, equivalent to APHIS here in the U.S. and uh, a number of others, CDFA, I think, in Canada. So um, just to further, I'd like to kind of dig a little deeper into this concept of pest risk assessment. I'm glad that that question came up. Um, you know, when you're looking at submitting a, a, a regulatory dossier for a pesticide, for example, you have to show usage and things like that. Do you see this as a potential uh, tool that companies could use both in terms of whether it's a chemical or maybe they want to uh, deploy a biological product or microbial product to control pests. Do you see that as a potential tool for their dossiers? And really in that regard, showing that, you know, what the potential impact could be. Like in terms of reduction of the pest. Yeah, yeah, reduction of the pest, but also potential usage mm -hmm. based on a particular year, because usage data is something that is very difficult to get. I mean, we have uh, a number of different agencies around the world that try to collect mm -hmm. usage data, but it's not that precise. So is there something where it could actually be used for predicting usage? I haven't actually thought about predicting usage. I guess you'd have to, so if you were thinking about predicting like landowner usage specifically, or, uh, or in general, maybe you've got a region that's going to be impacted, or I mean, take it with, let, let's say you're thinking about, this isn't a crop, but it's for sudden oak death, what's the treatment for sudden oak death, what's the breadth of the application, what would be needed for that, et cetera. So sod's probably actually a bad example because they cut down the tree and burn it. <laughs> I know. But just just yeah. the first thing that popped into my mind. Okay. Yeah. We'll use spotted lantern. I'll use yeah. spotted lantern fly. So okay. a lot of um, homeowners are applying like your traditional kind of um, dinotetheron or bifenthrin that's in your household. Yeah. Right. And those are chemicals that APHIS and regulatory agencies are also using. So you could look at the model, model what you think the population will be, and then compare it to the data and say, okay, we didn't get reduction. So we think these regions could be using like these households, because that is something that's actually happened is people don't like it and they're trying to get rid of it. Right. For spot lander and fly, but that's impossible to measure real realistically but yeah. you could potentially use it to get a sense of that. It's it not. Might, it might be a little easier to measure if it's a crop, let's say, yeah. where you've got some history of usage over time. Mm -hmm. And I guess that then comes to the point that, you know, are you, I mean, and you mentioned management practices in your presentation, but these could be management practices that growers use. Yep. And, how you actually incorporate those and you know one issue that's always been of interest to me is what you know how do we get everyone to kind of use the same language in reporting mm -hmm. you know, so that we're able to really compare apples to apples yeah and that's i guess in terms of like growers if we had growers actually using it they could enter what they did and either 
after the fact or before the fact and say, I plan on using this or this, they could compare how well the model predicts that each one of those would work and then make a decision on which one to choose. Yeah, a, a long time ago, I think it's been about 15 years ago, I actually wondered if we could develop some kind of an app that would do it in real time. And actually every time a, a grower does something in a field, it gets recorded and then could come in. So I could envision that, you know, maybe you might use something like a, a blockchain model or something where a grower's data would go into one pot and would be available to them, but then it could be extrapolated and anonymized and brought into the larger picture for everyone else, but still would be useful in terms of answering questions that the farmer may have. Yeah, and that's kind of where we're thinking with that like USDA ARS partnership is that they could do the security because they already have a lot of that data, like in terms of like the NAS, NAS surveys, et cetera, in the back end that we just can't have access to, right? Right. Yeah. But they have access to it. So they could like anonymize it, push it forward to us, push it back to the growers in a way that would be helpful for them to actually do something with. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So there's something there. We are exploring it. It's in the really, really early phases because they're just now rolling up this initiative. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to be asked to be a part of it. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, yes, let's try to get this involved and see what happens. Well, I know there's a lot of other uh, projects around the world that are actually trying to, to work on this. So I think it would be very interesting to to see what is happening very broadly um, and what tools we might be able to bring together and, and actually really create true robust systems that could predict and provide true analytics for growers. Uh, well, there are, I think there's, there may be a couple of more questions, but we're out of time uh, for this, but Chris will take a look at them and can respond individually if we have not already addressed them during the webinar. I want to thank you again, Chris, for uh, kind of leading us through this uh, complex uh, topic, but an extremely important one if we're going to get to the, the vision of enabling growers to, to use good practices and sustainable practices for addressing uh, crop production. So thanks everyone for participating today and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next webinar, which I think is in March, something like that. But um, we look forward to seeing you then and be sure and sign up for our next one. So thanks everyone for participating. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks, Chris.